Congenital hypothyroidism is a common cause of preventable intellectual disability. Prompt diagnosis by newborn screening and early and adequate treatment results in grossly normal neurocognitive outcomes in adulthood. Failure of normal neurodevelopment even though can result even if screen was negative but later on the features are there. These features are characteristically seen as large posterior fontanel, large tongue umbilical hernia, prolonged jaundice, constipation, lethargy or hypothermia in a newborn. Combined maternal and fetal hypothyroidism, for example in patients with severe iodine deficiency or untreated maternal hypothyroidism can lead to significant neurodevelopmental impairment even though adequate postnatal LT4 or levothyroxine therapy has been given. So, the current video is focusing on the recent American Academy of Pediatrics 2023 guidelines on congenital hypothyroidism. At places in the video, I have also compared it with the previous guidelines which were given by the Indian Society of Pediatric and Adolescent Endocrinology in the year 2018 and which is what we are following till date. Before proceeding on to that, I'll take a moment to thank every one of you who is a part of my endeavor for child health. This channel, of course, helps in clearing your concepts and keeping you updated with the latest. I am overwhelmed with so much of love, appreciation and respect. And this is what keeps me going despite sometimes being so very busy on the chair I'm currently at. Thank you for all the motivation. As regards the time as to when the TSH should be tested in a newborn, what we knew till date was that a cord blood or a heel prick dried blood spot sample was to be tested for TSH between 3 to 5 days of life. But AAP strongly recommends that a dried blood spot sample should be used for testing TSH between 48 to 72 hours of life. This reflects the normal surge in TSH concentration of about up to 60 to 80 million international units per litre that occurs within hours of birth in term newborn infants and resolves over the next 5 days. So if we are doing between 3 to 5 days then the surge would have started diminishing and between 48 to 72 hours the surge would be at its peak. Also at less than 24 hours of age if you are testing TSH values then instead of using the normal reference ranges for TSH you should you will have to use the age specific reference ranges and preferably repeat a screening test between 48 to 72 hours of life. If newborn screening is performed after 30 days of life, in that case also you have to use age specific reference range for TSH. False negative newborn screening results can be obtained in a baby who is acutely ill after transfusion of blood products or because of errors in the processing of specimens or errors in the reporting of results. The TSH cutoff for confirmatory test as we knew till date was more than 20 million international units per litre in cord blood, more than 34 in between 24 to 48 hours of life and more than 20 again when the baby was more than 48 hours of life. The AAP simply says that you have to use age specific TSH cutoff ranges without uh, any doubt. In case you have to perform a second newborn screening. For example, in babies who are preterms less than 32 weeks gestational age or who are very low birth weight babies, then in that case, you have to perform the second newborn screening test at 2 to 4 weeks of age. However, if second newborn screening is done at less than 36 weeks of postmenstrual age, it should be repeated again 4 weeks later or at 36 weeks of postmenstrual age, whichever is earlier. So, in these cases, that is uh, preterm and very low birth with babies you will have to you can have to repeat newborn screening three times determining the cutoff of tsh for preterm infants what we have been practicing till date is the same as that for a term infant but now the aap clearly recommends that gestational age specific newborn screening tsh reference ranges should be used for these babies how do we interpret this newborn screening result and what action do we take subsequently if the value of TSH in dried blood spot is more than 40 milli international units per litre, we take a confirmatory sample from the serum and start thyroxine therapy. 
but if it is value if its value is less than equal to 40 million international units per liter then we do send a confirmatory serum sample for testing but we don't start levothyroxine here i would like to remind you of two basic knowledge nuggets first is that in primary hypothyroidism tsh increases even before free t4 decreases but in secondary hypothyroidism free t4 is reduced but pituitary is still not able to produce tsh and therefore tsh might not increase as expected so when do we start this levothyroxine therapy in patients who have low free t4 and raised tsh but in patients who have low free t4 and normal or low tsh in that case we must first evaluate for central hypothyroidism before starting treatment with levothyroxine one must also know that congenital hypothyroidism is treated with enteral levothyroxine at a starting dose of 10 to 15 microgram per kg per day it is administered once daily infants with severe disease as defined by very low pre treatment total t4 or free t4 concentration should be treated with the highest initial dose starting from at around 15 microgram per kg per day when should thyroxine treatment be started in mild congenital hypothyroidism cases first when tsh value is more than 20 milli international units per liter or on confirmatory test or the values are persistently more than 10 at more than 4 weeks of age transient hypothyroidism should be suspected when there is a low t4 requirement particularly below 2 microgram per kg per day to maintain the euthyroid state after 1 year of age or when there is lack of need for increasing levothyroxine doses over time or when there is absence of abnormal tsh values any time during the treatment causes of transient hypothyroidism can be maternal graves disease iodine deficiency since it is required for synthesis of thyroid hormone and wolf jakoff effect which is suppression of synthesis of thyroid hormones because of excessive intake of iodine permanent congenital hypothyroidism should be suspected if at all there is thyroid dysgenesis or serum tsh is more than 10 milli international per unit international units per liter after the first year of life on treatment how do we administer levothyroxine it is given consistently in timing and manner and if enteral administration is not possible iv levothyroxine may be given at a dose which i had mentioned previously it was 80% but the guidelines mention 75% of the enteral dose and a particular brand or generic preparation from a single manufacturer should be used always the required dose of levothyroxine may be stable or it may change with time and levothyroxine dose requirements can be affected by chronic illness organ dysfunction medications changes in weight dietary soya intake levothyroxine absorption or serum estrogen concentrations once you've started levothyroxine therapy based on the newborn screening results a downward adjustment of the dose may be needed to avoid overtreatment after you have assessed free t4 tsh at 2 weeks of age for follow up free t4 tsh values need to be repeated at 1 to 2 weeks of age and then every 2 weeks until tsh normalizes then in first 6 months every 1 to 2 monthly from 6 months to 1 year of age every 2 to 3 monthly and between 1 to 3 years of age every 3 to 4 monthly and after 3 years of age every 6 to 12 monthly elevated tsh and normal free t4 is referred to as hyperthyrotropinemia or subclinical hypothyroidism it represents a mild primary thyroid abnormality also growth and adult height are generally normal in children with congenital hypothyroidism in whom levothyroxine therapy is maintained with tsh and free t4 in the target range what we knew till date is that reevaluation of thyroid axis should be done when there was there is a possibility of transient congenital hypothyroidism however aap says that requiring lower dose of levothyroxine less than 2 micrograms per kg per day or absence of abnormal tsh values any time during the treatment mandate a reevaluation of the thyroid axis aap 23 has also given some nuggets about imaging in congenital hypothyroidism 
It says that thyroid ultrasound or scintigraphy may assist in establishing the etiology of congenital hypothyroidism. Imaging may also inform prognosis if it identifies an ectopic or a dysgenic thyroid gland which is a kind of permanent form of congenital hypothyroidism. In most cases, imaging does not alter the clinical management of any patient before the age of 3 years and monogenic causes of congenital hypothyroidism may be categorized generally as causing thyroid dysgenesis or dyshormonogenesis. So with this we come to the end of the video and I guess this video shall help you a lot in your daily clinical practice as well as in writing your exams and viva. So thank you so much for a patient listening and watching and please do share the video.